All right, so good morning and welcome to a Google Hangout about passive versus active voice and which one is which. So um, welcome Ariana and Zach and Matthew. And um, let's go ahead and get started. We're gonna get started with a plate full of chocolate chip cookies. Who wants some? Raise your hand. That's what I thought. Um, I want you to keep an eye on these cookies. These cookies are um, at this point really important. And we're gonna also revisit fifth grade. Do you remember the differences between subject, direct object, and indirect objects? Who remembers that? So take a look at, good. So Matthew should know, there's mom, and mom has a plate of cookies, and here's Jake, who would like to receive some of the cookies. So if we're looking at this in terms of um, the verb, the action of a verb, what's mom going to do with those cookies? And if you're being silent, yes, very good. Thank you, Matthew. She's going to give them to Jake. So we have an active verb here of give. And, and the cookies, right, he definitely asked nicely, see what a nice young man he is, and mom, may I please have, please have some cookies? He did say please. <laughs> okay, so mom takes the cookies, and the cookies are being passed over to Jake. And they, so she is pushing an action on them. And Jake, as he's receiving them, he is taking that action. So for the sentence, if we were to look at it as a sentence, mom will give Jack the cookies. Which one is the subject? Mom is the subject, that is correct. And the verb phrase is what? Not just give, but will give. That's good. Yes, will give. So mom will give. And then what is the direct object? This is where it gets a little tricky. Ah, and this is where the confusion starts. <clears throat> the direct object is indeed the cookies because they directly receive the action of the verb giving. That makes the cookies, the direct object. And so Jack, who's receiving the action of the cookies becomes the direct object. So if we were to look at this again, the whole sentence is active. So mom will give Jack the cookies. And these are all, and this is how we primarily speak anyway in English is we, we start with a subject and then the verb. That's active voice, subject, verb, and then you can get into your objects, either direct or indirect. So the passive voice, you move the subject to the end or you take it out altogether. So here's an example. The cookies were given to Jack from his mom. Now the basic actions of the verb and the subject and the indirect object and the direct object are all there still. Even though if we were looking at this as a, as a sentence to break down the sentence, may, the cookies would be the subject we're given was the verb, but actually now you're starting to get into a tense that it gets a little complicated. I just want you to realize that the action of the verb never changes. The cookies are put up front because now they've become the most important object in the sentence. Mom is at the end. And notice something you can do. You can actually take mom out of the equation. The cookies were given to Jack. Either one of those makes it passive. So um, notice how the focus of the sentence changes. The cookies were given to Jack from his mom. Now all of a sudden, oops, back up. The cookies are now in the forefront of the of the subject of the sentence. So 
it's not that they're the subject of the sentence, I misspoke. They're the focus of the sentence. So here's another passive example. In this case, we're going to make Jack the focus of the sentence. So Jack received cookies from his mother. Now where's the focus? Whatever comes up front, and that is Jack. So the purpose of passive voice is to intentionally take the focus off of the subject and put it somewhere else. Mom should be the most important person in the room because she's holding the plate of cookies. But if for whatever reason we want to focus on the cookies or focus on Jake, that's when we start shifting sentences around. The other thing I want you to look at is um, in this one, you still have kind of a direct verb, received. It's also in the past tense. But we have in this one a helping verb, were. They were given. Uh, passive sentences, for the most part, have a helping verb, but to be verb with them. That's another way that you can figure it out. So the reason that we are studying this particularly with um, racial profiling is because with Bob Herbert's article in particular, he wants to put the focus back on the objects, those things that have received action and the action has come from police. So let's do a little practice with this. Um, these are some sentences. In fact, these are the ones that we had up early in the module. These are sentences that Bob Herbert uses for the passive voice. Ethnic profiling is practiced throughout the country. Not everyone who is stopped is frisked. Dion Dennis was stopped and searched outside his apartment building in Harlem. People are threatened with arrest for disorderly conduct if they object. What do you notice about what's written in red? What can you tell me about what's written in red? It is an action, yes. They are in the past tense, yes. But there's also how many of them. How many words are in that verb phrase? Right. And that first word is a to be verb. Is, are, was, were. Those are all to be verbs. And they're, they're being used because they are showing that action is being thrust upon them. So if we look at this first sentence, ethnic profiling is practiced throughout the country. What is the focus of the sentence? Just the focus. Very good, ethnic profiling. So in this case, Bob Herbert wants the focus to be on that ethnic profiling. But who's doing it? In this sentence, who's doing it? Do we even know? Okay, law enforcement. So it's the, the intention is law enforcement is doing that, but notice that law enforcement is not mentioned in the sentence. What do you think is the purpose of that? What is the purpose of inputting that? To draw attention where it is practiced. Where it is practiced? So it's practiced throughout the country. Is that what his focus needs to be? Who it is happening to? Do we even know who it is happening to? No. What is this? The, if the focus is ethnic profiling, why did Bob Herbert write it this way? If it was law enforcement, 
he would say what law enforcement practices ethnic profiling but he didn't do that what does he want what is happening right he needs to focus we want the focus to be on ethnic profiling and especially since the police are going to come along later and say this is not ethnic profiling this is criminal profiling and so the ethnic part is the part that Bob Herbert wants that focus to be on. So looking at this one now, people are threatened with arrest for disorderly conduct if they object. This is another passive sentence. And we can tell right away that it's passive how. How do we know this is passive? Right, it doesn't say who's doing it. We have to infer that. But how do we know that this is so? Okay, I see what you're saying, Matthew. So we don't know who's doing the threatening, who's doing the action. So that's one clue that this is definitely a passive. The past tense verbs and not directly quoting people. And not just past, but using that to be verb are. So we, since we don't know who's directly doing the threatening, that is how we know. And the fact that there is that to be verb up front. In this sentence, who or what is the focus of the sentence? People. And again, what is the reason Bob Herbert has written the sentence this way? What is the rhetorical strategy for writing this sentence as a passive sentence? I know there's good composing of responses going on right now. <clears throat> okay. Um, threatening does make this a, a, a focus. Yes, people are threatened. Um, and not just the threatening, but the people who are doing it. So people become the, he, he's wanting people to know. And notice it says people and not certain people or ethnic groups, or he's saying people in general are being threatened. Good, okay. So when does he use the active voice? And this was um, within one of the other lessons, but take a look at it. He just all of a sudden has a shorter paragraph. So he had certain sized paragraphs and then all of a sudden he's got these little short ones. The police say they also stop people for wearing inappropriate attire for the season. And the police department insists that these stops of innocent people, which are unconstitutional, by the way, help fight crime. And they insist that the policy is not racist. So if you recall, the question was asked, why does he all of a sudden change to the active voice in this section of the essay? Um, what were some of the responses that you had to that? to put the blame on police officers for what they said. Yes, that makes that the focus there. Why doesn't he put the focus on police throughout the whole one? For throughout the whole article, he, the, it's kind of like, you know, he's got these passive sections and then just kind of slips them in. He changes to the active voice because he wants to show directly what the people are police are doing without being confused. Okay, good. So he's, 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 um, he's on the sides of the victims. So he puts the victims out there in front first. And then finally, when, when, you know, he's gone through all of this part of the um, essays, and he's, he hasn't really mentioned law enforcement that much. Then all of a sudden, he changes to the police, he's got the focus on the police. And then notice what, um, this is really kind of unusual because if you've ever heard 
uh, let's say um, a press conference, so a crime has just been committed and there's law enforcement personnel that make a speech. What voice do law enforcement people usually use, passive or active? What voice do police do? Mm, not quite. If you, and, and there's plenty of them out there, especially with all the horrible shootings that have been going on, but when law enforcement get up there, here's what they'll say. Uh, for example, the, the shooting there uh, in Las Vegas. <clears throat> law enforcement, or the, the suspect was found to have 48 different um, assault rifles in his room. Is that passive or active? It is passive. Now, why would the police, so, and then they would also say something like, um, uh, the suspect was found with contraband. Passive or active? Mm -hmm. Law enforcement uses passive voice because they cannot come right out and accuse somebody of doing something. The, the suspect shot all these people. They can't say that. It has to be proven first. So what's, what's very interesting about what Bob Herbert does here is that he's using passive voice throughout the whole article until he starts talking about the police. And then as soon as he talks about the police, he's using the active voice. I don't know if he did that intentionally or not. Um, if that is something that he did naturally or um, whether he really wanted to do it intentionally, but it does have a certain effect when you look at the police are doing this. Okay, um, let's do a little backward practicing here. And what I'd like you to do is in the chat box, type how would you change this to the active voice? We can, we'll work through this one together. Ethnic profiling is practiced throughout the country. And we said earlier, who's the one who's doing this? Start with who's doing it. Okay. So that'll be your first word. And then what's your verb? You say if police is your first one, they're the ones doing it, what are they doing? Police practice ethnic profiling throughout the country. Very good. Okay, wanted to make sure I had, I saw all of those. Nice job. Okay. Um, what is the rhetorical impact between the two of them? So if you look at the sentence you just typed and then you look at the sentence, the original sentence, what is the rhetorical impact of either the active or the passive? Which one do you think has more of an impact? Okay, <clears throat> um, remember we said that it's always the, the uh, whatever is up front. So Bob Herbert puts ethnic profiling first, but the active form of this, police practice ethnic profiling throughout the country. If you read each sentence, uh, I think maybe it's the rhetorical impact that, is that the one that you, okay, rhetorical impact. <sighs> Anytime you're writing or speaking, all the way, the, all the different ways that you use language is called rhetoric. And rhetoric, um, you know, that's the one that um, 
it's where you start with ethos, pathos, logos. This is um, rhetorical means using your words in a specific way to influence other people to to prove you're right, to have to get them to change their minds, and so you you guys are all good writers. So you know what that kind of feels like when you have a sentence and you think, that doesn't sound right. That doesn't do what I want it to do. That's when you're looking at rhetoric. And so when we're looking at these two sentences, if Bob Herbert wanted his sentence to focus primarily on the police, he would have written it in the active voice, police practice, ethnic profiling. But instead, he wanted that ethnic profiling to be the focus of it. So in, you know, and I don't have the information, I didn't interview him personally, but it would seem to me that he was, if he was sitting there editing his paper, he wants that ethnic profiling to be up front. Is that a little clearer? Okay. All right, and if you have any questions, just kind of throw it in there. Um, let's try this one. So let's try a different one. And notice, notice that I have two colored up here. That is because there's two actions going on. Not everyone who has stopped is frisked. How would you turn this into um, active voice? And remember, you're asking yourself, who would be doing this? Police do not frisk everyone they stop. Very good. I love how they how each of you popped that all up at the same time. Very good. Okay, so let me get back over here. Here we go. And and it, yours are just a variation on mine. Um, oops, back, back, back. So let me try, well, let me ask the question again, see if you can have a better grasp of this one. What is the rhetorical impact of changing that sentence from passive to active. Is it stronger? Is it changing focus? Is it what well, what's it doing if we change from passive to active voice here? Matthew thinks it's stronger. Okay. Changes focus from everyone to police, back to the police again. I know that Ariana is typing like mad. She's eating. <laughs> Somehow I think Zach just got a boot to the head. Okay. Um, Thank you. Yeah, it's changing that focus. Now, and Matthew, I'm going to throw this one at you. Why is it stronger? You're thinking it's stronger. What's making it stronger? And by the way, there's no correct answer here. Just for you, what makes it stronger? And while he's typing that, Zach and Ariana, do you agree with him that it is a stronger sentence in the active voice? Okay. See how fast Matthew can type. <laughs> and while he's typing it, 
that's exactly why there is no correct answer in any of this. It's the rhetorical impact. It gives blame to the police. Okay, thank you. Um, these sentences will affect different people different ways. If you have, if you know somebody who's in law enforcement, you'll have a different reaction to each of these sentences. Um, right, it puts more focus on a larger sample group and sets it on a smaller sample size. I like that. So it kind of, it does narrow that focus, brings it down into, it, because there, this is, you know, from everyone to police, that is making it narrower. It becomes stronger because it is active and gives blame and can affect the way that people read the sentence. I like the way you put that also. This is why, I don't know if you've come across any English teachers who have told you, you need to write in the active voice. Um, has any, have, have, has anybody been told that before? You need to make this sentence more active. Okay. I will tell you that once you get into college, it will happen. The, the active sentences, you've been told to do the opposite. Oh, really? Um, Zach, what are the uh, topic, or what's a topic, a sample topic that you would have been told um, to write in the passive voice? I do know that um, for students who are taking the advanced placement courses, they are told for sure, do not write in the passive voice. And in fact, there are some out there who say, just don't use any to be verbs at all. So um, let's see, paper on great whites and focused on nothing but sharks. Well, now that's interesting. <laughs> wow. Um, I'm. I'm gobsmacked. I don't know why you would be told to write in the passive voice on sharks. Um, if anything, that would drive me crazy if I had to write about sharks in the passive voice. That's just, that's silly. Thank you for sharing that, Zach. Um, okay, so go ahead and type in the chat box the active form of the sentence. Dion Dennis was stopped and searched outside his apartment building in Harlem. Yeah, but I still don't know, Zach, how you would write about sharks in the passive voice so that you would be saying things like, <clears throat> oh gosh, uh, uh, shrimp or krill is a main staple of some sharks or um, dead whale carcasses are eaten by sharks. That would, that would drive me nuts. Very good. Thank you, Zach. No copying, Zach, <laughs> as Matthew and Ariana read or write. The other thing that we're looking at, um, what I've noticed is that we use police a lot or law enforcement. And if he had that many times the police, the law enforcement, police, law enforcement, his, it, the focus then does shift toward police, but really he wants these victims to be the ones who are up front. Very good. Awesome job. Okay. Um, we'll work in the other direction now because this is, this is, this truly is what they want more so in college, and that is your writing should primarily be in the active voice. So these are actually um, active sentences. I'm sorry, I just said the wrong thing. These are active sentences. We're going to change these into passive voice in the chat box. So the these actually come from the Dan White quote. If you notice, his is primarily written in the active voice. So let's see what happens when um, we change his voice to act passive. Certain groups simply harbor more lawbreakers. How would you change that to passive?
Very good, Zach. So you've moved lawbreakers up front. So moving the direct object. In fact, I don't think there's any more way we could do that. See what the others are looking for. Okay. Just waiting to see what Matthew and Ariana come up with. So Zach, while they're typing, what is the rhetorical impact changing this to passive voice? Very good. What is the rhetorical impact? Anybody. And Matthew, don't forget the harbored part. So, um, Actually, w without the harbored, your sentence becomes even stronger and could possibly even get you, if you were to actually write that, a lot of people be mad at you. Remember that when you're doing the passive voice, you still need to keep the core verb, but you're probably going to wind up adding a to be verb in front of it. So it takes away the blame in the passive voice you're saying very good because it's it's like it's almost like lawbreakers kind of stand outside of society and so it does seem to make it a little bit more um i need a word maybe a little less threatening i guess okay good okay we'll try one more this is changing a active sentence to passive voice. However, the retail industry loses over $31.3 billion every year and shoplifting represents about one third of that. How would you change that into the passive voice? And you actually have, um, oops, sorry. You can tell Mrs. Campbell did not put her phone on silent before she started this. <clears throat> there are two here. Um, it's a compound sentence. So you will want both of them, both independent clauses in the passive voice to keep it parallel. Very good. Very good, Zach. Make sure that you got a comma splice there. So what do you need to fix it? There's a couple different ways to fix yours. You don't have to type the whole thing. Just throw in what would you put in between the two of them? Semicolon. Very good. You could also add while. So shoplifting represents one third of the $31.3 billion that are lost in retail industry. Okay. Um, that's a great sentence, Matthew. The first part though is still active. But since you changed that second one into a dependent clause, I think it would be okay. Notice the two be between Zach's sentence and your sentence. What is the rhetorical difference between Zach's sentence and Matthew's sentence? And Ariana, what, which which of the two sentences do you think has the greater one? Okay, Matthew says he took out the retail industry. So by taking out that retail industry, what happens? Very good, Ariana. Now you two do have a comma splice as well. What are you going to need instead of that comma? 
Matt's focus is on the shoplifting, the actual shoplifting. Very good. Okay. Excellent. All righty. Um, I'm going to ask one final question, and then I'll be taking other questions if you have any. For the essay you were writing, so you're responding to Dan White's quote about how it's necessary for merchants to hire people to go around and watch certain groups of people as they shop. So for the response, which voice is better for you to use considering what you want to say and why? Okay, Zach's going to use a combination of passive and active voice, and I like your answer so that it can be better heard by your readers. Um, I agree with you. The There's some students, and especially if they've had teachers like you, Zach, who say they want it all in passive voice, I don't find passive voice to be all that uh, influential. And that's why the college and professors don't want you to write in that passive voice all the time because it's not clear what your subject is. If you're moving that subject to the end of the sentence or you're dropping it out altogether, then it's kind of unclear. It makes it unclear. But if you use a combination as Bob Herbert did, where you want your focus to be in this place first with the victim, the recipient of the verb action, and then you want to put the blame on whoever is doing that action, then you need the active voice. So active to argue against or for Dan White's argument with some passive to not come across as aggressive. That's really good, Ariana. That's a really good response. And Matthew, to use the active so that it focuses on one thing. And you know what's great is that I know the writing style of all three of you, and each of you have defined your writing style just in this response. And all three of them are correct, even though all three of them are different. So this kind of gives you an idea of, of how you're using the passive versus the active voice. Uh, hopefully this has clarified it, but I'm ready to answer any questions. Um, you can either type them in or uh, hopefully you can, you know, unmute your mic if you want to ask any questions. But do you have any questions maybe of specific um, activities that we've looked at or anything that, ah, oh, the modals. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, modals simply are the shoulds, woulds, coulds. They are, um, not they're they're what you're hoping will happen but they're not exactly what will happen modals happen in both passive and active voice so let me um let's see can you give me an assignment number zach where we can take a look at um or maybe i can find one here uh, let's look at 3.2.5 and this is in an activity we got to go to the next one for the activity Okay. Um, so modals are just the helping verbs. Any of these that indicate possibility, may, might, can, could, or are likely to. Um, so let me open this up. Okay. All you're looking at in this activity are the verb phrases. That's it. Uh, I'm not going to be able to, I, I think I can only highlight, I can't actually do this circling. So what you want to do in each of these is just look for the verb. So for this first sentence, because of their position of authority, police may use their authority to shame members of minority groups. I only want the verb phrase. What is the verb phrase in that one sentence?
may use. Very good. And is there a modal there? Yeah. So all you're going to do, circle may, but double underline both may and use because may use is the full verb phrase. You just need to circle may because it's a modal. It's just saying it may happen. All right. Statistics show that a police officer is more likely to pull over a black man for speeding than a white man. What is the verb or verb phrase? Is just it now you're more likely here is actually an adverb. The only verb you have is is. To pull over is called an infinitive, and it's not actually the main verb of the sentence. It's just adding more information. So um, has, have any of you taken Spanish? You should, you, if you have taken Spanish, um, I think even French would have it. Okay, good. The, anything that starts with, so this would be like the A-R, I-R, E-R verbs. And do you have infinitives in French as well, where it's kind of, there's a, a what would be equivalent to, it's kind of like the, the um, most basic form of the verb. I don't know if French has that. I, my father was French Canadian. They beat the French out of him when he was five years old. So, um, but anything, we are unsure. Okay. Anything that starts with two, because we have it up here as well, to shame to pull. These are all infinitives. They are not part of the main verb. The only thing we have here in terms of action, and it's not even action, is um, these statistics is, and then it defines what it is. So only is is un double underlined in this sentence. That's it. Okay, the next sentence. When someone is judged by skin color or accent, it can be shameful and humiliating. We do have um, an independent or dependent clause hooked onto an independent clause. All I want is the main verb. Main verb of this sentence. Can be, very good. That is it. Shameful and humiliating is part of uh, the adverbs that explain what it can be. So, uh, and is can one of your modals? Yep. So you double underline the whole verb phrase can be and circle can. Now, we have this lovely little beast right here. It's not fair, it's not equal, it's not just. And it was a trick. <laughs> and I'm sorry about that. I didn't write it, but I know the person who did. And so I'll tell her, you know that's tri a trick, right? In the three linked together, what's the only verb? Yeah. In fact, it's not even the it's, it's just the apostrophe s um, because it is the subject. So somehow you have to double underline just the apostrophe s. I, the uh, apostrophe s in all three of these. That is it. That's all your verb phrases. So there's no modals in that either. Police officers should protect and serve everyone, not just white people. What's your verb phrase?
police officers should protect and serve everyone. Right, should protect and serve. And you have a modal there. Very good. It's a double underline. Should protect, serve, and then circle should. Okay, Zach, do you think you can do the other paragraph on your own? I have a feeling he's going to say, I want one more. <laughs> By the way, Matthew and Ariana, do you guys have any questions while we're waiting for Zach? Okay. Do you think, Zach, that you have enough information right now to go back and look and double check it? Or did you want to go through a couple more? So, Ariana, you, if you have no other questions, then um, hopefully this has been helpful to you. And Matthew, you too. Um, I'll stick around with Zach if he needs any more help. Sure, Zach. If you want to just go ahead and, and um, send that to me, um, we I can take a quick look at it. But just do me a favor and go through the way we did the first paragraph. Make sure that that's what you're seeing in that second paragraph before you send it. And go ahead and send that through an inbox message, and I can respond back to that. Okay? So thank you guys for coming in. I hope this has been helpful to you and um, have a great day. And if I don't hear from you again, then have a great Thanksgiving as well. Okay. Bye-bye.